Hello, everybody. In this video lecture, we will cover ecology of ecosystems. And um, to help myself, I'm going to use a PowerPoint. So that's the PowerPoint I will use to cover this topic. So let's go ahead and begin. I'm going to pick up my pointer. So ecosystem include community of species in a given area and all the abiotic factors, such as energy, soil characteristic, water. Uh, in previous lectures, we talk about populations, we talk about, um, um, so we, uh, yeah, let, let me just, yeah, we talk about populations and we talk about communities. Um, and uh, in this lecture, we cover ecosystem. So now when we are looking at the community level, then we only talking about living organism. When we're looking at ecosystem level, we include also all these environmental factors that affect a life of community and their well-being, their interaction with each other and with their environment. So there are three broad categories of ecosystems based on their general environment. Uh, we have freshwater ecosystem, marine, and terrestrial. Um, and within these three categories um, are individual ecosystem types based on environmental habitat and organism present. So this is major broad categories, and then within we will have um, specific ecosystems. So freshwater ecosystem are the least common and uh, occurring on only 1.8% of Earth's surface. And this system include lakes, rivers, streams, and springs. Um, they're quite diverse and support a variety of animals, plants, fungi, produce, and prokaryotes. So you can see over here some example of the freshwater ecosystem. Atlantic, that is standing water, uh, lotic, that's a running water ecosystem, and wetlands, and wetlands where water level fluctuates up and down, and often seasonally as well as annually. And that will include marshes and swamps. A lotic ecosystem will include springs, streams, river, and Atlantic will include lakes and ponds. Um, then we have marine ecosystem. Marine ecosystem are the most common and comprises, um, I'm sorry, comprising 75% comprising of Earth's uh, surface and consisting of three basic types. We have shallow ocean, deep ocean, and deep ocean bottom. And, and of course, the amount of uh, sunlight and um, um, as, and other resources such as food, right, uh, varies when we go um, deep to the bottom of the ocean. Um, and we expect to see different flora and fauna in this, um, in, in, in this different uh, parts of the ocean based on the, um, how deep it is and how far it is from the shore. And terrestrial ecosystem, uh, also known uh, for their biodiversity, are grouped into large categories called biomes. So biome is a large-scale community of organism, primarily defined um, on land by the dominant plant type that exists in geographic region of the planet with similar climatic conditions. So what we'll determine biome uh, are uh, climate. Right, so places with a similar climate will have similar biomes. And what determine biome is mostly the dominant plant type that exists in this particular region. Examples of biomes include tropical rainforests, savannas, desert, grassland, temperature forest, tundra. Those are just some examples. We have other type of biomes as well. Um, so here you can see how um, different types of biomes located on the globe. Um, 
right? So we have tropical forests shown here in this green color. Uh, and then we have, let's say, chaparral, um, that this area here and around Mediterranean Sea, right? In this area, that. So, <clears throat> so distribution of biomes um, uh, mostly in, affected by climate, right? And how far it is from the equator. So terrestrial biomes are primarily determined by climate, especially temperature and rainfall. Uh, so Earth's global climate patterns are largely the result of uh, how much um, light energy is received. Uh, so it's input of radiant energy from the sun and the movement of our planet uh, when the planet is um, moving around the sun and uh, also rotation of the Earth. Um, so you can see that if you look at the equator, the sunlight strikes more directly. And further away we go from the equator to both North and South Pole, uh, we increase the, um, well, we, uh, we, I'm sorry, we decrease the angle of oncoming sunlight. And um, the, um, the way how sunlight strikes the Earth affects a temperature in this area. And you can see uh, we're getting um, further from the equator, um, we see the in decrease in the temperature, you know, and this is related to um, uh, sunlight striking the Earth. Um, heated by the direct rays of the sun, air at the equator rises because warm air rises. Then it cools, forming clouds and drops rain. This largely explains why rainforests are concentrated in the tropics, the region from the uh, Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of um, Capricorn. Uh, so if you can see um, here, um, close to the equator, we have um, pretty high, um, you know, um, okay, so here and um, in this area, when the Earth's surface warms enough, water evaporates, right? So when water evaporates, it became the uh, water vapor, um, like a gas form and it rises because warm water rises. When it reaches a <clears throat> specific um, distance from the Earth, it cools down, right? So it rises and it cools down and it condenses into clouds. And then um, it uh, falls back to the surface in the form of rain, rain. So that's precipitation. So most precipitation happens in the tropic region. And that's where we would find you know, good temperature, enough amount of uh, water, and that's where we have the tropical rainforest. Um, climate is also affected by proximity to large bodies of water and the presence of landforms such as mountain ranges. So the previous one, uh, let me go back, we said that the climate is affected by um, amount of sun energy received and our planet's movement in the space, right? So that's what we described. But climate is also affected, um, is that area close to, let's say, ocean or, um, or big lake um, or big body of other body of waters, like maybe large rivers that will affect climate in that particular area and also presence of the mountains. Mountains affect climate in two major ways. And first, air temperature drops as elevation increases. So you can see on this diagram over here, when we increase the elevation, uh, this is shown in feet to um, 10,000 feet, we will see drop of the temperature. And this result in the several biomes moving up at tall mountains. Um, you can see we can uh, start with a desert and then it can change in a grassland, a wood lake, right? Pine, oak, oak woodland, pine woodland, 
spruce fir forest. Right, so that's how the uh, elevation affect climate. And another way mountains can affect climate, climate is that they block the flow of cool, moist air from a coast and cause radically different climates on opposite sides of the mountain range. Right, so here it shows us Sierra Nevada um, mountains and how the um, cool and moist air from the Pacific Ocean uh, actually is blocked, right, <laughs> by these mountains. So when you, uh, on the other side, that would be completely different biome and very often is, it will be a desert because uh, desert is not so much about temperature, desert is really about precipitation. So low precipitation will cause um, the desert biome to be formed in that area. Um, we will not cover every single biome. This is not the point. We will just uh, talk about two biomes that are relative to the area where we live. So Chaparral. Chaparral is uh, primary in the coastal areas, um, uh, coastal areas with Mediterranean climate about 30 degrees north and south of the equator. Um, so where would we find the chaparral? Well, we will find chaparral in our area, that's a California chaparral, and again, it's closer to the um, uh, ocean. It's not in the middle, um, let's say, of the Southern California. Right, so I would say it's in the San Diego area or Long Beach area, right? Somewhere where we get close to the coast. Also, chaparral is, uh, uh, is found in uh, Europe. Um, it's Mediterranean chaparral. Uh, so what is the climate for chaparral? Ch uh, climate is hot with dry summers, mild, wet winters, and very slight variation in seasonal temperature. So it's a very nice, really, climate. People like living in Chaparral, considered to be one of the most desirable biomes for uh, people to live. Um, plant adaptation um, for Chaparral biomes are mostly low-lying shrubs and small trees. Many plants uh, have leathery leaves to resist water loss because temperature is pretty high in that biome. Many plant species have oils in leaves to help them resist fire. The fire will take our weaker plants and uh, they don't belong to, so, to this uh, you know, area. So fire sometimes can be um, very uh, helpful and lead to the um, healthier communities. Uh, adaptation among animals will include camouflage to avoid predation, uh, many animals will change their diet as the season changes. Um, threats to the chaparral, the major threat is human development, very desirable climate for humans to live. And by um, developing our own cities and uh, uh, freeways, we uh, take away habitat for plants and animals, right? We increase the pollution, we increase our carbon uh, footprint and so on. So those are the major threats. And another biome, that, so that was chaparral, another biome that we will cover also very relative to the area where we live is a desert biome. So location, depending on type of desert, you will find them in various locations. So you can see on this map over here, right? You can find it in um, North America, in, in South America, in Australia, in Africa, in uh, Asia, over here. Um, so the major factors for desert is very small amount of precipitation, less than 10 inches per year of rain. And because of so little rain, we have little uh, to no topsoil. And this is also due to, um, first of all, due to uh, low precipitation, so not that many 
plants are growing and then usually deserts are characterized by very high winds. Uh, minerals not deep in soil uh, and um, soil is too dry for decay. And when soil is too dry to decay, we also have very little soil, very, um, uh, very um, poor composition of the organic um, stuff that of course uh, doesn't have a positive effect on the vegetation. Uh, so while there are many types of deserts, they all share one characteristic. They are the driest places on earth. Uh, desert plant adaptation. Uh, plants adapt with um, different uh, parts um, or different organs. Uh, let's say we can see adaptation in roots. Roots can be, let's say, long uh, tap roots that go deep into the ground and uh, tap into groundwater sources. So, um, so plants trying to reach for water, right? If there is some uh, uh, underground water um, source, then plants will grow very long tap roots. Uh, other plants, however, have extensive horizontal root system. This way they can collect every single drop of water when uh, rain is available. And those are roots are not very deep at all. Um, another adaptation is succulents, including um, uh, cacti. And this is um, succulents are plants that have the ability to store water in their roots, stems, leaves, or fruits. Right. So let's say here's the barrel cactus uh, that <coughs> saving lots of water in it uh, stems. Um, also another adaptation is, um, so the first adaptation, if we, if we go back, so that adaptation is to reach for water and store this water. Uh, this adaptation is to retain this water, right? To decrease the water loss through their uh, surface and especially leaf surface. So if you look at the desert uh, plants, their leaves are usually small. Sometimes they don't have leaves, they have spines. And this limits the amount of surface area exposed uh, to the drying heat. Also leaves of uh, desert plants very often glossy. And uh, glossy leaves, when we have like, you know, substance uh, similar to the lipid, so it's kind of like this um, fatty um, substance, uh, fatty stuff covering the surface of the leaf. And what it does, it reflects sun's radiant heat and uh, reduces the temperature of the leaf and reducing the evaporation. Waxy leaves also prevent um, losing this moisture. Right, so here, adaptation how to retain water, small leaves, glossy leaves, waxy leaves. Um, also, uh, water can be lost through the stomata, and stomata is the organ of, uh, of the uh, plants. Uh, usually it's found on a, uh, uh, I would say, <laughs> dorsal surface, dorsal surface of the leaf, right? So on the bottom of the leaf, and uh, stomata are a pores. Um, and many um, desert plants, they open stomata only at night when temperature cools down. And again, it's also retained water and a low evaporation rate. Adaptation for desert um, animals, they, many of them are uh, very well adapted to live with little or sometimes even no water. So they get water from their food. They have thick outer coat, again, to prevent water loss. Uh, they uh, burrow during a day. Uh, some have large ears. And usually it's a smaller animals with the less surface area. Uh, large ears um, for uh, cooling themselves down, right? So it allows some maybe evaporation happens from that surface. Um, threats to the desert, um, 
And again, the biggest threat to any environment nowadays are human activities. So it's residential development, recreational activities that destroy habitat for plants and animals. Some plants also removed by collectors, endangering the populations. Okay, so uh, what we um, talk about, let's go ahead and um, um, kind of like do a very quick review. Right, so we gave a definition for ecosystem. Ecosystem are all communities and all abiotic factors. And then we said that there is three types of ecosystem, fresh water, marine, terrestrial. And then from, ter uh, and those, well, um, terrestrial uh, ecosystem, um, they divide it into biomes and biomes depends on amount of um, precipitation, temperature and the major land um, that grow in that area. And we cover very briefly two terrestrial biomes that are chaparral and desert. Right, so that was the first part of this um, lecture. And um, now we will continue. So um, let me pick up my pointer. Every time I exit this presentation mode, I lose my pointer. Um, so for organism to um, exist right, and continue reproduction and so on, they need uh, energy and nutrients, right? Nutrients or chemicals. So in ecosystem, energy flows through ecosystem um, and uh, ultimately out of ecosystem. So the only source of energy our planet has is the light energy of the sun. All right, um, so if sun gone, life is gone on our planet, right? So the, because we need constant input of energy, energy does not recycle. So energy flow in, some of this energy is um, transformed into different type of energy, right? Let's say from electromagnetic energy into chemical energy of food, and some uh, energy, um, leaves the ecosystem mostly in the form of heat, right? So energy flow, uh, chemicals, however, are recycling. All the chemicals that we have today, those the chemicals we had always had and we will have till the end of our planet. So we recycle the nutrients and we receive energy from the sun. Um, so each day, Earth receives about uh, 1,019 kilocalories of solar energy. How much is that? Well, that's the energy equivalent to about 100 million atomic bombs. That's huge. That's a huge amount of energy received every single day. However, most of this energy is absorbed, scattered, or reflected by the atmosphere uh, or the Earth's surface. And only about 1% of this energy is converted to chemical energy by photosynthesis, right? Because we receive this electromagnetic energy, but for animals, this is not usable energy. We cannot use it for our biochemical processes of our bodies. We cannot uh, move, we cannot talk, we cannot um, and reproduce our cells, animal cells cannot divide using this electromagnetic energy. We need actually energy, we need chemical energy to do all this stuff. And our chemical energy comes from our food. Um, so that's why it's important that we have uh, autotrophs, organisms that convert this electromagnetic energy into chemical energy. And this process of conversion called photosynthesis. So uh, the amount or mass of living uh, organic material in the ecosystem is biomass, right? So all th this mass of all living organic stuff is called biomass. So the rate at which ecosystems produce, uh, producers ecosystem producers convert solar energy into chemical energy stored in biomass is called primary production, right? So uh, we have producers, plants, algae, uh, some bacteria, 
So those producers, they convert the solar energy into chemi chemical energy, but that chemical energy is stored inside their bodies, and that's what biomass is. And this rate of production called primary production, and it yields about 165 billion tons of biomass every year. You know how much biomass is produced. So let's say if you, if you clean your yard um, in a fall, Right, so you have your spring and summer um, when um, trees growing, all these leaves and grass is growing. And then you start collecting this in, in fall, you start collecting all these leaves that um, fell down from the trees. That's a huge amount, right? We need lots and lots of um, trash bags or something, or trash cans to get rid of all this biomass that was produced in our small backyard. Right, so if you take, if you imagine that uh, our planet is like your backyard, so this is how much uh, biomass is produced per year. But different ecosystems vary considerably in their primary production. So if you look over here, it gives us different biomes and average primary production gram per square meter per year. And you can, in, of course, if you take, let's say, a desert, right? So you take desert or tundra, this is very uh, small production of biomass. If you take, let's say, tropical rainforest or uh, algae bed and coral reefs, right, those are huge uh, producers of biomass, those biomes, right? In the deep ocean, you don't have that much biomass because not that much um, solar energy is available deep in the ocean, right? So, um, <clears throat> dynamics of ecosystem. Um, so we have autotrophs and heterotrophs, and autotrophs, they require only inorganic nutrients and uh, outside energy source for uh, to produce organic nutrients. Um, autotrophs we call producers, um, so um, we would define, okay, so um, living organisms, they need a source of carbon and source of energy, right? So autotroph, autotrophs, autotrophs, they use inorganic source of carbon. You know, guys, that we are carbon-based life, so all organic molecules require carbon. Um, so your body can build those organic molecules. And autotrophs, they use inorganic source of carbon. Um, and they can be divided in uh, photosynthetic photo autotroph and chemo autotroph. So autotroph means um, carbon is inorganic. Now photo and chemo tell us what type of energy they use um, to, uh, to make organic nutrients. Photo autotrophs, they use sunlight. So they use sunlight and inorganic carbon. Um, these bacteria, they use chemical reactions as a form of energy, not sunlight, and inorganic carbon again, right? And then we have heterotrophs, and heterotrophs, they require organic source of carbon, and um, usually they require uh, chemical energy for the uh, energy source, right? However, we do have Photo heterotroph and chemo um, heterotroph, but um, uh, photo heterotrophs are only bacteria, the same as chemo autotrophs. Uh, and heterotrophs, let's say if we take animals, we need organic source of carbon and we need chemical source of energy. Heterotrophs are consumers, will include herbivores, carnivores, omnivore, detritivore, and decomposers. Um, so energy, we already uh, talk about it, that energy flow and chemical cycling. Um, the first law of thermodynamics tell us that energy is not created or destroyed. It only changes forms. And each transformation result in less energy than uh, originally started with. And eventually all energy from the sun dis uh, dissipates as heat. So you can see that we receive solar energy, producers convert this energy into chemical energy. Lots of this is um, 
dissipates in the form of heat, but whatever was converted into chemical energy now can be used by consumers, right? Uh, stored inside their bodies, the decomposers uh, would return um, these organic nutrients back to the pool of organic nutrients. And uh, finally, all the energy received uh, is uh, dissipates as heat. So we need constant input of energy. So food chain um, allow us to see how this energy uh, and nutrients move from one organism to another, right? So food chain is a linear sequence of organisms through which nutrients and energy pass as one organism eats another. And uh, in the food chain, we have several um, levels. Uh, we have producers, primary consumers, higher level consumers, and finally decomposers. So each organism is in the food chain uh, occupies a specific tropic level, and tropic level is a food level or energy level. Um, and um, when it occupies specific level, uh, we call it its position in a food chain or food web. So just to kind of like put it very sim in a simple perspective, food chain, um, well, we, we just talk that energy flows through ecosystem, right, nutrients recycle, to show us how energy um, travel and how food and nutrients recycles, we can use this food chain. And food chain just show us who it's who. Um, we can have um, these food chains in a terrestrial um, uh, ecosystem. Here it's shown in a marine ecosystem. And we also will have uh, producers. Uh, this, type, uh, this time producer is um, phytoplankton. Those are microscopic uh, photosynthetic bacteria or proteins. And then the primary consumers will be zooplankton. Those are also microscopic um, approaches or small uh, animals. <clears throat> so here's our uh, linear kind of relationship from producer to consumers, right? The ones that we described food chain. But food chain um, um, can, um, well, we can use what we call energy pyramids to show really the amount of energy that is available for each tropic level. So that's called tropic level over here. That's a tropic level. That's a tropic level. Um, and the rule is that only about 10% of the energy from one tropic level is available for the next tropic level. And that's energy pyramid that shows the energy relationship between tropic levels. Uh, at the uh, top of energy pyramid, we have uh, long-lived animals, and um, they eat many times their body weight to stay alive, right? Because so, so little energy is available that um, animals and uh, tertiary consumers, they need to eat a lot, <laughs> right? To, uh, to get this amount of energy they need. And also that's why these energy pyramids cannot be extremely high. Usually it's like four, maybe five uh, only levels because it's only 10% of energy is available. <clears throat> we can apply the same um, concept to a human population. And uh, if we, let's say meat eaters, then we on a secondary consumers level, Right, so actually we're using more resources to be uh, eat, uh, meat eaters. Uh, if people would be all vegetarians, then we can decrease the amount of resources needed. Right? Because if here we have 100% of energy, right, that these people are received 10% out of this 100, and this person received uh, out of this 100 only 1% 1 of energy. Um, so food chains are very simple representation of um, this relationship within ecosystem. So usually we use food webs uh, and food webs are 
uh, many food chains woven into um, this elabor elaborate uh, network of um, relationship. So we can see we have different producers and primary consumers um, can you know, feed on a different type of plants. Then we have um, the secondary consumers. So you can see here that relationship very complicated and a simple food um, chain wouldn't be enough to represent um, this interaction between uh, producers and consumers. That's why we use food webs. Uh, consequences of food webs. Um, one consequence, uh, consequences of food webs is biological magnification. Biomagnification is the increasing concentration of uh, persistent toxic substances in organism at each uh, successive tropic level. Um, so if we, if we look over here, and um, this shows us um, nitrogen enrichment uh, and how it increasing when we moving up to the higher tropic levels. Right? Because if you have accumulation of some toxins, let's say in a uh, phytoplankton or in a, uh, mussels, then all the next animals that feed on this organism, they uh, have higher and higher concentration of these uh, toxic substances in their bodies. That's why the United um, States Environmental Protection Agency recommends that pregnant uh, women and young children should not consume any uh, swordfish, shark, uh, mackerel, and because they have very high content of mercury. And individuals are advised to eat fish low in mercury. So the fish low in mercury will be on a low tropic level. Right? And it will be salmon, a shrimp, a pollock, catfish. I actually, uh, pollock, that's my favorite type of fish. I really like it. So if you never tried um, pollock, go ahead and try it. You might like it. Tastes very good. Um, so what we just um, talked about was primary how energy flows through the ecosystem and we mentioned, mentioned food chain and food webs in the next next lecture we will talk about recycling of the uh, organic matter recycling of um, the nutrients because life depends on recycling of chemicals and uh, when we talk about recycling of chemicals we call it um, uh, biogeochemical uh, cycles, and they involve biotic components and abiotic components um, from the uh, reservoirs where chemical accumulates. Um, so I think that's our last slide. I, uh, over here, that's the last one. So uh, those biogeochemical cycles include water cycle. Those are major because obviously all the chemicals are, uh, are recycling. We recycle all the chemicals. We receive energy and we cycle the um, nutrients and uh, chemicals. And uh, important cycles include water cycle, carbon cycle, phosphorus cycle, nitrogen cycle. And we will talk about it in our next lecture. Um, so that's it um, for this part. And that was Ecology of Ecosystems. Um, and thank you for watching. I hope it was helpful.